going to disappear. I'll come on in a minute. morning everyone we're going to get started in just a couple minutes we're still waiting for some people to come in but good morning as you're coming in and typing into the chat box if you could please remember to uh, send your messages to all panelists and attendees we'll talk about this in a minute during the functionality session Hello, good morning. Hi, everyone. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Justin Cayley. I'm marketing manager for National Geographic Learning. And uh, I'd like to uh, take a second to welcome you all to uh, this National Geographic Learning webinar on best practices for teaching reading to young learners. Uh, thanks again for joining us for uh, today and this morning for what we hope will be a very useful and informative webinar with our featured speaker, uh, Andrew Tiffany, who I will introduce in just one minute. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to some of the functionality of the webinar platform. Andrew, would you go ahead one slide? Perfect, okay. Um, so these are some functions and tools that you can use uh, during the session to interact with the presenter and the other attendees that are attending today. Uh, today's session uh, will be very interactive, and we encourage you to take part in the discussion by using some of these tools. Uh, first off, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there are several different icons. The, the first button on the left is the chat function. Please make sure that, that when you're using this, uh, make good use of it during the session, but when you do, uh, make sure that you're sending your messages to all panelists and attendees, not just all panelists. Uh, so this is important to ensure that the whole group can read your messages. So set to all panelists and attendees. Uh, on the right, uh, you'll see a Q&A button. Uh, you can use this to ask the presenter or host questions or to make a request during the session. Uh, we'll do our best to answer questions as they come in. Uh, but we'll, there'll also be an opportunity at the end of the session to ask questions uh, to the presenter and you can use this function at that time. Finally, uh, one last piece of functionality for you. Um, if you're having difficulty seeing the screen that the presenter is showing, uh, make sure that your view options are set to fit to window so that you can see the entire screen. That's it for the functionality part. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our featured speaker for this morning's webinar. 
We're very pleased to have us with, with us today, uh, Andrew Tiffany, uh, National Geographic's Learning's own teacher trainer. Uh, Andrew has over 15 years of experience uh, in teaching in Greater China. He's worked with both EFL learners and international school learners from pre-K all the way up through grade 12, both in English and in subject content. Uh, Andrew likes to take ideas and concepts and distill them down to basic elements that work uh, to find ways of doing things efficiently and effectively. And he also likes to help teachers to find more and better ways of helping their students. So if you could join me in welcoming Andrew Tiffany. Good morning, Andrew. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everybody. Um, just so you know, I, I just had a little experience with the, the platform here. I completely lost the chat box somehow. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, I'm going to carry on anyway. But unfortunately, I can't use the chat box at the moment. I think it may come back to me later. Um, I was going to ask you how long you've been uh, teaching young learners just to make a start. So maybe if um, you can type into the chat box how long you've been teaching young learners. Justin, uh, if you can give me give me some feedback on some, uh, what gets got, popped in there. Yeah, we've got a range of people. Things are coming in uh, like from three years to four years. She, uh, uh, to 12 years, yeah. two years, a uh, full range of experience. Some people with yeah. a lot of experience and some yeah. uh, come in with, with less so. So Great. it's like yeah. you've got, you got a wide range. Yep. No, that's good. So what I'd like to suggest today for everybody is as we go through and we learn some things today, if you want to contribute your own ideas in the chat box, please feel free. Add, add your own thoughts and ideas as we're going through because this kind of environment allows us to collaborate a lot when we're um, sharing ideas and the way I learned just about all of my teaching um, skills and tricks and tips is just I learned them from other teachers watching or listening um, to other teachers right so please share your own ideas as well because we can contribute and learn a lot together okay great so let's take a look at what we're going to do today uh, today we're going to talk about reading for young learners, so usually grades one to six, uh, we're talking about here. We're gonna talk about what reading is. So when we talk about reading, what do we mean, okay? We'll talk about some key features of learning to read. So when we learn uh, the skill of reading, what's involved, and we're gonna talk a little bit about interactive reading, and then we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about different ways to develop pre-reading, during reading, and post-reading, or uh, after reading activities that will really help your learners get the most out of the reading that they're doing, okay? So uh, without further ado, let's get stuck in uh, and start learning about uh, reading. So what is reading? So reading is a process, right? It is something we do, it takes a bit of time, and it's the process of transferring information. The idea is someone has written, and now you are reading, right? And the information is an input for you. Um, but when we are reading, we have to interpret the meaning of that reading, okay? It's, it's not an automatic thing. It is a cognitive skill to be able to interpret what's there. And we're doing it from visuals because reading is a skill where we use our eyes, obviously. Um, and we don't just use text. Uh, in the past, we might have used text almost solely, okay? But in today's world, we're using a lot of text, but also a lot of images in different forms. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later, okay? So um, whereas this is an example from one of our programs, um, today I'm gonna to be using examples from a National Geographic Learning product called Look, uh, which is designed for grades one through to six. Um, this is a particular reading um, from grade one. And within this reading, uh, you can see it's all text, but it's actually supported by images, which you will see a little bit later on. Okay, great. So let's keep looking through here. Um, now, in terms of reading, what is reading? I'm going to go over four key points for reading. I'm going to say reading is a bottom-up process. It's also a top-down process that is non-linear and multimodal. So I'm going to describe what I mean by each of these and give you some examples as we go along. Okay, so First one is bottom up. What do I mean? Well, we start with small things like phonics and words and sentences, right? And I know some of you will do this when you are teaching reading. You will spend a lot of time teaching phonics and blending. And if you see the words on the page, then we can uh, figure out how to say the word. We can put the sentence together and we can get some meaning out of that. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you an example of 
how bottom up reading works by looking kind of th at things one piece at a time. I'll just note before I start that what I'm going to show you is not for a young learner. This is really for you as an adult. Okay, it is not a young learner piece of text. Okay, uh, so ready? Okay, take a quick look at this. Okay, now, whoops, a daisy. Oh, there we go. Sorry, that was pretty quick. Um, but what meaning, what ideas did, whoa, sorry, what ideas did you get out of that? I'm trying to get back to the chat box. I'm having difficulty. What ideas did you get out of that from, from seeing that piece of reading? Right, Justin, you might have to report for me. Sorry, the chat box is doing weird things for me today. That's fine. Yeah, so far we're, we're waiting for people to type into the chat box. I know it was pretty quick. So yeah. some of you might have missed things out of that, right? But that's okay. What, what did you get out of it? Did you recognize words? Did you pick up any meaning from that process? So some people are saying she, she's spending time with her daughter. Daughter, that's yeah. Because of something about a daughter. Yeah. Uh, some people say a little too quick. Something about reading with a child. Yeah, good. Okay, good. So there, you're getting bits of information, but because it's coming at you quite quickly, you don't have time to really look at the words in detail, right? Um, and with bottom-up reading, we really do need time to put all of the pieces together, right? So let me show you, as I accidentally did already, this is what I showed you. This is the piece of reading that I just showed you, okay? Now, if you look at that, is... Is this an easy piece of reading? Is this tricky for, for as an adult, right? Um, is there, are there things in here which make it harder? Um, what, what would you say? What would you say looking at this? Okay, so I might just answer my own questions because I can't see the chat box, but for some of you, you might say, well, actually there's a couple of words here that are kind of difficult, right? like these two words, right? Uh, does anyone know what enervated means? Maybe some of you do, some of you don't. Or this word, um, it looks like the word arid, but it's actually here uh, not being used as an adjective. It's actually being used as a verb and it would be arid. Uh, is that the same as arid or not, right? So there are some things here which make it a little bit more difficult. And some of you might be saying like, wow, this is a really long sentence, right? So that makes it more difficult. Now, if I present that reading in a slightly different format, I can make it a little easier to understand. If I present it this way, so let me just put a line down the middle of here, okay? Then the difference between the left side and the right side that you can see on the screen is here. What we've got on this side is we've got chunks of meaning, okay? This makes the reading easier to digest, okay? Although her energy enervated, okay, something's happening to her and her creativity are read. Oh, that's another idea. Okay, so there's two things happening to her. She still made time. Ah, made time to do what? To read. To read what? To read with her daughter. Oh, okay. So by presenting it in this way, um, the reading becomes a little bit more digestible because each of these pieces is a chunk of information that we can piece together. Okay, so sometimes the layout of your reading can affect how easy it is to digest in a bottom-up fashion, looking at the fragments of the text. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at uh, something a little bit different with this as well. Now, so far I've been talking about bottom-up. Now, what if I give it to you top-down? And the way I do that is I give you context, right? So now I give you an image here, okay? And by giving you this image, and putting it together with the text, now we get some bigger idea about what's going on in this. So we're looking at it from the big picture coming down, top down, okay? So if you look at this picture, does that picture help you understand what the words innervated and arid might mean? Okay, so maybe now you're able to say, well, if her energy's innervated, well, looking at her, it looks like she doesn't have much energy, right? So her energy is like drained, right? Okay, and creativity is a red, a red, yeah, kind of, she looks like she's pretty dried up in terms of creativity and new ideas. And so having the picture to help us with the context helps us understand some of the vocabulary and the meaning of the reading, okay? So this is the way in which supporting the text with images and looking at it from a context or doing 
Other activities, which I'll show you soon in pre-reading, can really help our learners understand the reading more from a top-down kind of aspect. Okay? Okay, so um, also I mentioned uh, reading is non-linear and multimodal. So what do I mean by that? Here's an example. Again, this is an adult example. I'll show you a children's example in a second. But today when we read, we don't just usually read text. Usually we read something like this web page where we might start at the top looking at the title and then we come down to the text here. We go across and look at a graph. We jump down and look at something here. We come across to here. We're not just going down the page, right? We're jumping around looking at different things, okay? Um, and you can also see here multimodal. We're looking at graphs and images and sidebars and all sorts of different things, okay? So this is the way in which we often read. And you may know this yourself already if you read novels or articles or things like that. You know, how many times have you read page one of an article, then you've read page two, then you've read page three, and then something reminds you of something and you go, oh, I'm gonna go back and look at page one because I think I remember something from there that was useful and then I start going forward again. So we don't always just start at the beginning and go to the end, right? We tend to jump around, okay? Now in a young learner context, excuse me, in a young learner context, again, here's um, from look level one, this is for a grade one student, okay? Um, here's a reading about colors that again, we've got you know a heading and we're talking about a color wheel. Now maybe as soon as we see that, kids' eyes get drawn to the wheel, okay? And then maybe they read this and then maybe they're looking at the picture and they're coming down here and, you know, they're moving around the page. They're not just necessarily starting at the top and working to the bottom. Okay, so this is the way in which reading usually happens these days. And we need to do two things with that. We need to cater to it, but also be aware of it uh, for how our students will interact with our materials. Okay. And I know at the moment, like um, we're in this special situation at the moment where I know a number of you, uh, uh, probably a very large number of you are teaching online at the moment and you don't have books in front of the students maybe in the same way that you did, okay? Um, so some of the things I'll talk to you today as we go through some of these examples are about when we know that reading is nonlinear and multimodal, how do we use online teaching a little bit to help with some of these ideas, okay? How can we focus students' attention in the places we want it to be when we want it there. How can we deal with the multimodal um, or interactive nature of online teaching? We're not gonna do too much of that today. Um, I know if you've been uh, partaking in some of our other webinars, we've had uh, Werner Kuhn, um, who's been doing webinars with us. He just did one on Wednesday. He's got two more coming up and he's very focused on online delivery. I'll let him talk about a lot of those ideas, but I'll mention a couple more today as we go. Okay, especially on this idea of nonlinear teaching, uh, nonlinear reading, and multimodal um, exposure. Okay, cool. Okay, so just to review, um, as we said here, what is reading? It's bottom up, it's, uh, phonics, sight words, vocabulary, things like this. Uh, it's also top down, so building context when we read and using comprehension clues and you know our own stories did we ever feel like that mom who, who was reading to her daughter okay um, and also how we're using a lot of images as well as text we're using a lot of layouts and different ways to present that information in a non-linear and multimodal way okay great okay now i just want to make a quick couple of comments about reading materials for you I think this is useful because we need to be very careful about the type of material we choose for getting efficient learning from, from our students, right? Um, and it's important to use a text which is graded or curated, designed for a, a reader at that level, okay? Um, so we want it to be not too hard. We also don't want it to be too easy. Now, I use this um, terminology uh, to, to talk about this a lot. I talk about I plus one. Now, some of you may be familiar um, with something by Stephen Krashen um, in his natural approach. He talks about I plus one like this. Um, I kind of, I, I haven't, the idea I use is similar to his. It's not exactly the same. He's talking about a specific um, point to do with reading and something called interlanguage. When I'm talking about this I plus one here, basically what I'm saying is our students are at some sort of level, right? And we want them to achieve this kind of level up here, okay? Now we've got some options for how we get there. We can try and do this and just go boom, straight to that level, 
okay? But sometimes for our learners, that's too much, okay? They can't digest that much new information that quickly, right? And so instead of actually doing that, they are like, oh, blah, and then they just kind of fall back down again, right? Um, and that's when you get the blank stares and the kids don't know what you're doing. But instead, sometimes we just need to think, okay, well, if I give them a little bit of information, right, and I get them to this level, and then I give them a little bit more information next class, and then I give them a little bit more and a little bit more, by doing these like small kind of plus one kind of steps, then we can get them to this level eventually, right? We just have to make sure that we're not advancing too quickly. And that's the idea of a graded or curated text. It's designed so that the new information that the students are getting is not too much relative to their current level, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at what I mean by that. Now, here is this reading that I showed you earlier. Okay, now, Justin, I'll have to ask for your assistance again. Can you tell me and oh, tell us in the chat box, do you think this reading, now remember this is grade one, Okay, I'm talking about a grade one student, maybe second semester, maybe they're in semester two of grade one. Is this a hard reading, do you think, for a grade one learner? Uh, is this relatively easy? Um, is it something in between? What do you think? If you can pop into the chat box what you think. We have, we have see one, if I can... yes. Please make sure you're sending your messages to all panelists and attendees. Uh, yeah. But we've got some, yes, some that says depends on where you are and yeah. who your students are. True. Uh, for, yeah, some think it'll be a little bit hard for EFL learners. Yeah. Some think it's very easy. Um, so we go. really a, a broad, broad range. Of a broad range. Here. Okay. Yeah. So let me show you how this piece of text for this level and this program has been made relatively easy, right? Not simple, but it's still quite easy for these learners, right? It's very digestible, even though it's relatively long, right? Um, and the way it's been done is what I've done here is I've broken up that text into each of the individual sentences, right? And you can see here that all of the sentences are quite short, right? A lot of these sentences only have four or five words. That makes them much more digestible. There are no complicated grammar patterns. Um, you know, it's, it's all basic sentences and a couple of questions, right? So it's fairly straightforward in that regard. Now, the other thing I've done here is I've highlighted a few words. And the reason I've highlighted these words is that these are the only new words in this piece of text for these learners. Um, remember here we were talking in this uh, level, of, this is unit six, okay? So up, up until unit six, the learners have already seen all of these words already, okay? So there's not too many new words for them here. There's a lot of things they already know. And if I go and look at the uh, the, uh, the way that this reading could be graded on kind of an international scale. Now, I've done this using Microsoft Word. There is a, a, a text analysis um, tool that's built into Microsoft Word. You can use this as well. Down the bottom here, it says we've got the, uh, the Fleisch Reading Ease and the Fleisch Kincaid Grade Level Scales. Okay. Um, now, if you don't know about these, uh, this one here says it's uh, a reading ease of 100. Now, a reading ease of 100 is very easy, and when it gets harder, this number actually goes down, right? So uh, uh, something around a 20 would be actually very difficult, okay, um, on, the, on the grand scheme, right, for any, any age student. Um, and then the grade level, here it says 0 0.3, that's comparing it to a US grade level, okay? So if it's 0 0.3, that means it's more at kind of the kindergarten or beginning of grade one level for a US student, an American student, okay? Um, it's interesting to note that if I remove this one word, aquarium, from the text, then what that would do is actually take the grade level down to 0, 0.0, which makes it a pure kindergarten text at that stage. In other words, maybe the students can't read every word, but they will know all of these words at a kindergarten level, okay? so. This is one way you can look at any piece of text you have and, and understand its difficulty and compare it with other texts, okay? Um, so if you want to uh, find out a bit more about that tool, go and look in Microsoft Word and you'll be able to find out about these text analysis um, tools, okay? Um, here's another way to look at it. Um, I said the grammar is not too difficult. What I'm doing here, um, remembering that this is unit six, um, here I'm showing you the unit at when this uh, grammar first appeared in this level. 
So look at the photo as something that the students have been using since unit one. Um, this is, is started learning in unit two. Bedroom is vocabulary from unit six, right? Um, the idea of something in a house, okay, that's from unit six as well, or next to, that's a unit six idea as well, um, which has been introduced earlier in the unit. But you can see there's a lot of material here from earlier units. That means the students already know it, makes it very digestible, okay? Um, now, you might be looking at this and saying, hang on, where's unit three, four, and five? There's a lot of numbers here, but no three, four, and five. Uh, that was because three, four, and five were dealing with people, family, and my body. And those kinds of words are just not words and phrases that are showing up in this particular type of text, okay? But when we get to unit seven or unit eight, then a lot of those phrases and words start coming back in again, okay? Um, so I hope this gives you an understanding of how some texts like this can be designed to make it actually relatively easy for the students to um, digest the reading. And they're only focusing on a few new things, like a few new pieces of vocabulary and maybe uh, a, a new grammar structure like here with prepositions, okay? Great, okay. So um, now reading doesn't just have to be in reading, right? It can also be in other places. So here's a piece of text, which is a chant, and that's in a grammar section. You could treat that as a reading and do it the same sort of way. Um, here's another piece and another piece down here that can be used as reading, right? Um, or the lyrics of songs can also be treated as reading as well. So when you're doing some of the activities I'll show you soon, a lot of these things can just be treated as reading and you can practice the same reading skills with these things as well, okay? Great, okay. So uh, the last thing I'll say about reading material is also teacher's books, right? If you've got good teacher's books, they will have a ton of good suggestions. Like you can see in here, there's a lot of, you know, there's an activity in here. It's giving you all this little blue text about things that are appropriate to say to the learners. It's got reading strategies. It's a little hard to read, but there's a lot of tips in here that let you uh, give you good guidance about, okay, what do I do with this? right? Well, here's all the suggestions right here of what I can do with this, okay? Um, so good teacher's books really can help you a lot with reading as well, okay? Great. Okay, so now let's get into some tips and practices and see um, what sort of things we can, we can do with reading, okay? And I've got four main ideas I want to talk about, uh, and the first one is to try and make reading interactive, right? Now, this is especially true when you are in an online setting, a lot like we are right now and what you are doing with your students, right? Um, it's really important to try and get things being interactive because you have very limited information coming back to you in an online setting compared to when you're in a live delivery class. Like if you're in a live delivery class and your students are right in front of you, you can see what they're doing. But in this kind of online environment, it's a bit more difficult, right? Uh, it's a bit harder to see what's going on. So we need to try and find more ways to make it interactive, okay? Now, I will note that I'm not uh, going to show you, I'm gonna show you everything just using a couple of basic tools. I'm not gonna try and use fancy programs um, or anything like that. I'm just gonna keep it really simple um, and show you that you, maybe you don't need fancy tools. Fancy tools can help a lot, but I'm just gonna try and keep it really simple for today, okay? and uh, as I just mentioned, we want to capture students' interest. We want to keep them engaged, keep them interested in what's going on. Uh, we need to engage students in the process, okay? And we do that by asking a lot of questions. Now, I hope when I start doing a couple of things in a minute, I can get my chat box back because I'm going to need that. Um, but by asking questions, we can get a lot of interactivity going on as we as we read, okay? Um, and even in this setting, I want to move, I want to express, I want to act out, I want to use my facial expressions, I want to do all of these things. And in an online setting, maybe you need to exaggerate them even more to be able to pass that message on to your students since they're not like, you know, two meters right in front of you, right? Um, so we'll try some things here and we'll see um, how, how some things go. I'm gonna use this example but I'm not gonna use it on the PowerPoint slide. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump to this thing here. So um, this is uh, the classroom presentation tool. 
that goes with the look program. Um, you can see here all of the different units and things uh, that are in this particular level. I'm going to use um, this particular level here with the reading I was looking at is from here. I'm using the student book and we're looking at the reading. OK, so I'm going to use the tool here. It just takes a second to load. Here we go. This is the image you saw before, right? But when I start using this with my students, the first thing I'm going to do is actually I'm going to zoom way in like this. And we're just going to look at look at this to start with. OK, so now I'm going to treat you like my students for a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to double check again. I still can't get that. What I'm going to do, actually, I kind of want the chat box. Let me stop sharing for like 20 seconds. See if I can get it back and then I'll bring this back up again. So if you just bear with me for a second. Let me see if I can recover the chat box. Okay, let me try sharing again and see if we can make this work. Share. Yes, okay, that worked. I got it back. Thank goodness. Okay, <laughs> right. So, um, okay, so now I'm going to ask you guys some questions. So, okay, what can you see? What can you see here in this picture? If you type into the chat box, what things can you see? Starfish, good job. Gary says, what does Gary say? Toys, starfish, stingray, yeah, good. Fish, manta ray, oh wow, a shark. Cotton, ah, cotton, wow. Striped fish, good. Okay, so you guys can see lots of things, right? Okay, how many starfish are there? How many starfish? Two, very good. What color are the starfish? Blue, and what's the other one? Orange? Yeah, is it orange or is it red? I, th I think it's orange, right? It's a little hard to tell. Okay, so yeah, but some different things we can see here. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm just adjusting the chat box again. I need to grab another tool here. Here we go. Um, so yeah, so and as we're doing this, if I'm in this, doing this online, you know, I can be oh, okay, so what's this one here? Starfish, right? Is that the is that the red one or the blue one? Oh, it's the red one. Good job. Okay. Uh, and someone said this thing here. What's what's this thing here? What was that thing again? Stingray, right? Someone said manta ray, right? Now I could, this, my pen, unfortunately, it doesn't write very clearly on here, but I could also, oh dear. <laughs> I can't write very well. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, now, what about this thing up here? What's this thing? What's this thing at the top? What's that? A game. Very good. What colors can you see in the game? Now here, obviously, I'm using a lot of the the sentence patterns that we've used earlier, I'm reinforcing a lot of things as we're also, um, you know, working to understand the image that's in front of us. Now, you are currently typing in the chat box. We could, excuse me, we could do this in an online class. The kids could just talk to us, right? And then, you know, we can encourage them to be speaking to us in English through this way. Okay. Now, let me zoom out a little bit here. What else can we see in this picture? If I can get rid of the pen for a second. Uh, oh, go away. I'm in trouble with the tools here. There we go. Go away. Okay, so if I zoom out a little bit, okay, what else can we see here? What else can we see? A beard. Okay, you think this is a beard? Why do you think this is a beard? Why do you think this big round thing here is a beard? Why do we think it, it looks soft? Ah, very nice, Lara. Okay. It's an, okay, so to you, sorry if I'm saying your name correctly. Says it's an aquarium. It's an aquarium. It's a water bed, or oh, maybe it is a water bed, right? Um, down here, what are these three things at the bottom? What, what's what's this? What's this down here? Pillows, right? Good pillows, right? Again, I'm just prompting from the students a lot of a lot of things, right? And asking questions and trying to engage them, right? Now I'm also going to ask you now. What, what's going on up here? Like, I'll just use the mouse. What, what's going on here and over here? What's, what's all this blue stuff here? What do you think that is? What do you think all that blue area is? Water? Water? Water and sharks? So, question. Do you think this is a window into like a fish tank? Or is it a picture on the wall? What do you think? Is it just like a poster or a picture on the wall or is that like a window into a fish tank? So again, now you're giving me some things. Now I could also say, it's like, why do you think that? Why do you think 
that that is, you know, a, a window into a fish tank. Why do you think that is? Okay. I'm just watching what's in the chat box here. Look at the corners. Oh, okay, the corners are round. Okay, that, that yeah, it's, posters aren't usually round at the corners. That's a good reason. You just think it's an underwater, oh, you can see the screws on the wall. Okay, good. So you can see it look, the construction makes it look like that. Yeah, okay. So underwater room in a hotel. I think Analia knows what this is, right? Um, so yeah, so we can get the kids just thinking about, you know, is that a picture or is that real or, or what's going on? And this way we're starting to engage some other thinking processes. Um, some of you might know these as going towards higher order thinking skills or critical thinking skills, right? So lots of different things that we could, um, yeah, I, Kirsten, I like that, that suggestion, play bubbles in the background for effect. Yeah, that would be cool, right? Um, so yeah, if I just zoom all the way out here, here we can see the whole image and you can see that this is leading into the reading. So what I've been doing is discussing a lot of these questions about what's in the reading, okay? Now I've got another little task for you. What I want you to do is look at the picture, study the picture for about 20 seconds, and then I'm gonna give you a chat box quiz, okay? Um, if I was doing this as an online class, I could do this with speaking. I could just let the students use their microphones, but for today, we're gonna to use a chat box, right? Okay. Okay, so look at the image, have a look, see what you can see. Okay, now I'm gonna jump back to the other screen. Jump back to here, okay. And now we're gonna have a look. Actually, I'm gonna come down to here first. We'll do the chat box quiz first. So let's see, how many real sharks did you see in that image? Okay, some people are saying two, some people are saying three. Okay, how many were there? There are in fact three. Okay, let me show you, let me go back to here. So there's one at the top here, there's one over here, and there's also one hiding at the bottom down here. You might have missed that one at the bottom. Okay, very good. Okay, let's go, next one. What color were the starfish toys? Ooh, I asked you this, didn't I? What color are the starfish toys? D, yeah, I think most of us have got it, orange and blue, and that's because we talked about it, right? So good, yeah. Now, maybe we were debating, is it orange or is it red? But okay, cool, right? Okay, uh, next one, which image is the stingray? Now, stingray is not a vocabulary word for this lesson, but maybe I just want to orally reinforce the word, right? Um, just because it's an interesting word. So stingray, yeah, everybody's got it, it's C, right? And finally, um, whoops, which things were on the table? Sorry, I wasn't meant to show you the answers straight away. But in this one, I, I just had a list of things that were in the room and which ones were on the table, okay? Um, I've already shown you the answers. So yeah, we've got a vase and a clock, right? Um, so if I go back to the image here, jump back to here, we've got you know the vase and the clock on the table over here, right? So um, yeah, but this, as someone mentioned in the chat box, yeah, memory challenges are good fun for the kids, right? And they like to engage in this kind of activity. And again, it's letting them understand the picture. And I'm going for the top down idea in reading here, right? Okay, cool. Now I did have another note. I'm gonna jump back up, um, jump back up to here for a second. Um, language one, language two, right? Uh, so I'm assuming in your classrooms that English is your language two. English is the second language of your learners. And their first language is Chinese, Vietnamese, you know, um, whatever it might be, Japanese, okay? Um, question, is it okay to use their first language when you're teaching them their second language of English? What do you think in the chat box? Is it okay? Someone says, yes. Someone says, depends. Sometimes it's useful, not 100% of the time. I agree with that, right? I think it's okay sometimes, yes. So. I'll give you my point of view. Um, now, when I say this though, I'm gonna say that a lot, I know a lot of your schools and institutions have particular rules and policies about use of the first language in the second language classroom, right? So um, when we're talking about this, take into account what your managers and bosses want you to do. But my suggestion is, let's say we're looking at that word. Let's say um, we saw the picture of the pillows, okay? And I asked the students, what? What, what are those things there? And maybe they can use English to tell me that, but maybe they can't. And so maybe they're using their first language to try and tell me that that's pillows, right? So if they're trying to do this, 
then my response would be, okay, I'll usually let them try and then say, okay, now, does anyone know that in English? Does anyone here know what that is in English? And if one of my students knows, then great, then they recognize what that English word is, right? If not, what I'm just trying to encourage here is I'm trying to encourage the students to express and communicate, but even if one of my students can do it, I'm gonna make sure that English is what they finish with from that activity, okay? So for example, it's like, oh, what are those three things there? And one of my students says, blah, 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 because they don't know the English word. Oh, does anyone know that in English? No, okay. So everyone, this is pillows. Everyone say pillows, right? Okay, they are pillows. There are three pillows. Okay, so, and then maybe I go back to the first student and I say, so what are they? And hopefully I can get them to say three pillows in English, okay? So I do try and let them express, let them share, but then I will always try and finish by using English, okay? Cool. Um, so maybe try that yourself. Um, just maybe check with your school that it's okay to follow that kind of approach, okay? Cool. Okay, now I'm gonna jump forward again, excuse these slides. Okay, here we go. So uh, what we're gonna do now, we'll talk about pre-reading, uh, post-reading, and uh, sorry, during reading and after reading activities. And we've got about 20, a little over 20 minutes to do this, okay? Um, and so when I'm talking about pre-reading activities, they're the things you do to set up the reading. Now, you may have noticed that I've already done quite a few of these things already, okay? Now, what's the purpose of this? Um, sometimes you can think about why something is good by understanding if you don't do it, if you don't have it there, what's the effect, okay? And I'm gonna suggest that if you don't do pre-reading activities, it does make it harder for students to learn and it gets them frustrated because they don't know what's going on, okay? So if you have good pre-reading activities, your students are comfortable, they know what's happening, and that's gonna make reading easier for them, which is gonna make them more comfortable, they'll probably learn better, they'll like class more, right? All of these things, right? Um, yeah, as, as Taigo is saying in the chat box, activate, activate schemata and then engage them, right? That's basically what we're doing with pre-reading activities. So good good point on that one, Taigo, right? Um, Tiago, sorry. Is that hurt? Sorry, um, if I'm saying your name wrong, I apologize. Um, so some of the activities we can do is activating prior knowledge or reviewing. Now, that's what I was doing when I was, you know, looking at the, the image here. I was going over vocabulary and colors and shapes and things, right? Um, with the students, right? Um, I could also pre-teach vocabulary, okay? So maybe uh, in this one, I want to refer to, um, is this a house, right? What's a house? A house is, okay, we live in a house, you know, a house, uh, maybe I come back to here, you know, a house is, I need to give them a drawing of a house so they, they know what a house is, right? And I can talk about clock, where is the clock? Oh, this thing down here is a clock. Okay, can we see a clock in our classroom? Where's the clock, right? So I can pre-teach vocabulary so that when they see it in the reading, they'll understand the words, okay? Um, and in that way, just so you know, I can avoid translating during reading. If I pre-teach the vocab, then the students will know, generally speaking, what the words are, okay? Um, we already went through plenty of this, looking at the picture and the graphics, thinking about the, the little questions, what is this, what are they? Thinking about the big questions, where is this? Why is it here? Is that really a fish tank? Um, so we can deal with these kind of little questions and the big thinking questions as well, okay? Um, and then another technique you can use as well is a technique called I see, I think, I wonder, okay? I learned this from one of our um, uh, National Geographic Learning authors, uh, Dr. Zhang Kang Shen. I heard her talk about it first. Um, there's a lot of information about this process at this particular website, and I'll encourage you to, you know, you can go and look at it later. Um, it's you, you can use it for a lot of things, but especially visual things. So if I jump back to here, I'll give you an example, right? I could say, um, I see in the picture something that looks like a shark right? Um, I want, you know, I, I think this is a window into a shark tank. I wonder why someone put a bedroom in a shark tank. Hmm, why did they do that? So I see, I think, I wonder, lets me create a thinking process that ends up with a couple of questions, right? I wonder why they did this. And then maybe we can explore those questions as we're reading, okay? 
And if you model that process for your students a few times, your students can also then follow along. Okay, what do you see? What do you think about that? What do you wonder, right? Oh, I see a game, right? Um, I think you play the game by pulling fish. Um, I wonder who plays that game, right? I wonder who in our class plays that game, right? So this is a way we can use this kind of technique um, with, with our students, okay? Um, so uh, a little bit similar to that is also doing a KWL chart. Now, I'm sure many of you know what one of these is. I'll just sketch one up quickly. Um, so K is what do we know, right? W is what do we want to know, okay? And the L is what did we learn? So what was learned in the reading? So uh, this one here and this one here, these are the pre-reading tasks, okay? So I know that those things are sharks, right? So this is a little bit like um, uh, See, Think, Wonder, right? Um, I want to know why did they build a bedroom in a shark tank? Why? And then maybe after the reading, we can look at this and we can say, okay, did we find out the answer to that question? Okay, so this is a way to maybe have the students do this part of a KWL chart before reading, and then after reading, we can come back and do this piece as well. Okay, cool. So having shown you um, some of those pre-reading activities already when we, when we looked at the images and things, I'm now gonna jump ahead and focus on what we do during reading. And I'll give you some more examples of this as well, okay? Um, so during reading, we want to focus attention on usually one aspect of the reading at a time, okay? So maybe we're focusing on vocabulary, or maybe we're focusing on comprehension, or maybe we're focusing on grammar, or maybe we're focusing on pronunciation, okay? But we don't try and do it all at once, okay? Um, if we don't do these, again, what happens if we lack them? then maybe we have the students saying a lot of words as they read, but they're not really learning, okay? I'm sure you've experienced this. How many times have you had a book in front of your students and you say, okay, let's read, and they're like, this is a house. It is not in a, right? And they're, they're not even really looking at their book, right? They're saying the words, but they're not really learning, right? I'm sure you've had that experience. I have lots of times, right? So we need to focus their attention on something. So how do we do that with activities, right? Um, so one thing is we can ask phonics questions or word questions or form questions as we're going through. Now, again, this is a bottom-up skill, okay? It's looking at the little details, right? So if I jump back to the reading here, let me jump back to here. I'm just gonna zoom in on the reading a little. Here we go. Um, so I could say, oh yeah, okay, now let's look. This, this one here, PH, how do we say PH if I'm looking at a phonics? Uh, focus, right? PH, what sound is PH? Oh, that's right. Okay, so this is photo, right? So here I'm just looking at simple phonics, right? Maybe in another focus, I want to see, okay, let's find all, let's do a grammar focus. Let's find all of the prepositions. Where is all of the in the, on the, next to, under the, everybody underline. Okay, now let's read the sentences that have those things in them, right? So each time we do reading, we can focus on a different aspect, okay? Cool. Um, we can also go top down and we can look at comprehension questions. Okay, now I'll give you an example. Uh, let me zoom in even more and just scroll the screen a little bit. Okay, so maybe I just want them to read that much to start with. So look at the photo. This is a bedroom. It isn't in a house. It's in an aquarium. Ah. So maybe I ask a very easy question. Where is this bedroom? right? Oh, it's in an aquarium. The answer is right there, lower order question, right? Maybe I ask, why do you think it's in an aquarium, right? Now, we don't really know, but maybe we can have some guesses and engage some critical thinking, right? Um, or how do we know it's a bedroom from the picture? How do we know this is a bedroom? Oh, there's pillows, right? Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Okay, now let's go to the next little piece, right? Uh, we'll go down to here. Um, can you see the table? The table is next to the bed. It's white. The clock is on the table. It's small. The game is on the bed. It's yellow, red, and blue. The toy fish are on the bed too. Okay, so we've read through. Now, comprehension questions, right? Um, what thing has three colors? What thing in the reading has three colors? Okay, and so in this one, it's uh, the, you know, the game, right? Yellow, red, and blue. So they need to uh, understand the reading to be able to answer that kind of question, 
okay? And so we can ask lots of questions like this as we're going, okay? Great. Um, also, we can make predictions, okay? So if I said, okay, now you have read that much of the reading so far, what, there's a little bit more down here, what do you think the next part is going to say? In the chat box, what do you think? What is, what, what's going to come next? Maybe you remember from looking at it before, right? What, what, what comes next? Does anyone have an idea for what comes next? Maybe that's a little bit too hard, right? So, but what comes next? Oh, they're looking at the fish, right? And they're talking about how it's underwater, okay? So maybe students can make, yeah, describing something else, the background, great. So the students are um, predicting, right? What, what might be coming up. Now, in a book, that's really difficult to do because it's right in front of them. But in this format, like going online and focusing their attention on just one section, it's, it's a bit easier to do actually, isn't it? Okay, cool. Um, other things we can do, we can do popcorn reading, uh, we can do oops, we can do sound replacements. What are these different things? Um, popcorn reading, some of you may know, I'll just really quickly describe. Let's say you've got in your, in your online class, you've got a bunch of different students and these are all their webcam photos, right? And you say, okay, Tim and Joe, your team A, Sally and Ben, your team B, and everybody else, your team C, right? Um, and in an online session, you know, when you're teaching like this, or if it's your classroom the same way, right? You can say, okay, team A, you can start reading. And they're like, okay, look at the photo. This is a bedroom. Okay, stop, team B, go. And now team B has to read the next part from where team A stopped, okay? And then maybe after a little bit, you know, it isn't in a house, it's in team A. Okay, an aquarium, right? And so popcorn just means we're jumping around the room like popcorn's popping in a popcorn maker, right? Uh, to get the kids to read, okay? Um, this is a bottom-up activity because kids are paying attention to the words, following along and figuring out where they need to read next, okay? So that's an example of popcorn reading. Um, oops, uh, this is a little tricky to do in chat, but I'll get you to try anyway. I'm gonna read, okay? And when I make a mistake, then I want you to type oops as quickly as you can in the chat box or teacher you're wrong, right? In the chat box, okay? So you can type it in now and hit enter maybe when, when I do something wrong. So look at the photo. This is a bathroom. It isn't in a house. Okay, there we go. Oops, good. Oh no, what did I do wrong? This is, uh, what should it be? What should it be? It shouldn't be bathroom, right? Very good, it should be a bedroom. Good job, okay, this is a bedroom. It isn't in a, right? And so I can make mistakes and the students are paying attention to the words, right? Um, so this is a fun little activity. I actually learned this from my training partner, Kitty. Um, next one, sound replacements. Uh, this one can be a bit of fun. I'll give you an example. Um, you do this as a group, okay? You don't do this individually, usually. Um, but I'm gonna say, let's look at some, I need the highlighter back here again. Let's look at some um, interesting words that are in this passage, right? And I can see the word the quite a lot in this passage, right? So we've got the here, um, we've got the, we've got the, we've got the, okay. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna read this, but we're not gonna say the word the, we're gonna replace it with something, right? And what we're gonna replace it with is we're gonna replace it with an action and a sound, okay? So instead of saying the, we're gonna go beep, okay? So I can't see your camera, but beep, okay, right? So as we read through, we would do it like this. Look at beep photo. This is a bedroom. It isn't in a house, it's in an aquarium. Can you see beep table? Beep table is next to beep bed, right? And <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Mila's typing in. Um, uh, so this way, this again, the students are focusing on individual words, kind of like sight words, right? Now, maybe you want to have the students say those words. How about we just reverse the activity? So this time, we're going to replace every word except the. And I'll do that with, I'll change, I'll do clap instead of saying a word. So for example, the. 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 Right, and so we can do it this way as well, right? Um, and again, usually you would do this as a group and the idea is to focus the students' attention on individual words and, you know, especially where does a word stop and a word start and, you know, making sure they know that bedroom is one word, not two words, little things like this, right? 
So these are all bottom up activities. They really focus on the, the individual little elements of the text, right? We're not looking at meaning or comprehension in this way, but they're fun for kids, right? They're, they're quite a bit of fun, okay? Cool. Um, now, going on, post-reading activities. We've got about six or seven minutes left to go through these ones. Um, post-reading activities are what we do after, okay? And the good thing for these is it gives you reinforcement. It lets you go over things again, okay? Um, and you can expand upon the reading and you can do some other things with it, right? And develop more skills. And if you don't do these, if you lack them again, usually the students will forget what you just learned, right? Um, some of you may know things like the Ebbinghaus forgetting curves or something like this. Basically the idea is if I, this is time going across here. If I teach you something right now, you know 100% of what I've just told you, right? Um, but then as time goes by, we start to forget and our memory, our memory starts to fade, right? And so after a while, like we have forgotten half of what we learned. So how long do you think it takes to forget half of what you learned? What do you think in the chat box? What do you think? To get half of what you learned, so to forget, sorry, half of what you learned, how long do you think it might take? Two days, one week, one day, one day. 20 minutes, depends on age. Yes, actually it does. Um, someone said 20 minutes. It, it does depend on the type of material, but actually something like 20 minutes or maybe 30 minutes is very typical, right? Um, I have a question. How many of you can remember my name? Right? <laughs> and I'm betting right now, some of you are going, um, yeah, I don't remember his name. And that's because you, you, you heard that or learned that about 50 minutes ago, right? Um, what about the colors of the, 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 um, the colors of the starfish or the colors in the game that we saw? Now, because we showed it to you as a picture, that's automatically more memorable, right? Um, who can remember the Fleisch reading uh, ease number for this particular reading I've been showing you? Oh, yeah, what was that number again? So this is the point is that we forget information quite quickly. So here, by doing these kinds of activities, we can refresh the knowledge. And what happens then is when we refresh the knowledge, then if we do it again and again, then after a while, students don't forget. They retain a lot of their memories, a lot of the knowledge, okay? So this is why um, uh, these kind of activities, post-reading activities are very valuable, okay? So let's jump ahead. Um, some examples, we can draw new graphics. Okay, so we could say, okay, great. I want you to draw your bedroom under the, un, in the aquarium. What would your bedroom in the aquarium look like? Okay, so we could get the students to do an activity like that and then they could talk about it, right? Um, if we're reading a piece of fiction, a story, we could say, okay, so what happens next, right? Or in this case, nonfiction, we could say, what else is like this? So this was a bedroom in a strange place in an aquarium. Do you know of other rooms in strange places, right? And someone might, oh yeah, yeah, no, we, we have a bathroom in a strange place, or we have a, um, a, a living room in a strange place, or I have a house in a tree. What, you have a house in a tree, right? And so the, the children can contribute their own ideas, and maybe they know some other things that relate, and maybe we can talk about those things, and it helps uh, and remember some of these ideas, right? Um, we can also do Venn diagrams. So I'll give you a quick example. We could say, here's uh, what we did in the reading today. So we read about the one in, in, the, in the aquarium. And here's my bedroom, okay? Now, what things do, do we have in both bedrooms? Oh, well, my bedroom has a bed, just like the, the one in the reading. Um, my bedroom has pillows, just like the one in the reading, okay? I have the fish game, exactly the same as the one in the reading, right? Um, what about, well, their one has sharks. Yeah, my, my bedroom doesn't have sharks, uh, but I didn't see a chair in that bedroom and my bedroom has a chair. So we can get the, the students to do a Venn diagram like this and they're recalling a lot of the information from the reading and then comparing and contrasting with their own situations. Okay, good for their memory too. Okay, um, another one we can do uh, is we can do grammar study or grammar change. So for example, here we've got, um, let's say everything here is in present simple tense, like the clock is, right? 
it is small, it is on. Um, what else have we got? Uh, the toy fish are on the bed, right? Um, what about we say, okay, this is all present tense at the moment. How about we talk about we're making a bedroom and we want to make everything future tense. How would we change this to be future tense? And so we could go through the whole reading and we could change everything to future tense, right? So we can say, you know, it will be small. The game will be on the bed, right? The toy fish will be, okay, so in future tense, sometimes it's not too hard, right? What about if we did it in past tense, right? So by changing some things around, yeah, someone noticed in the, in the, sorry, mentioned in the chat box, you know, prepositions. How about we change the prepositions and make this a crazy bedroom? The clock is under the shark, right? Uh, the, the game is under the bed. Uh, what else could we say? The bed is on the toy fish. What? That would be crazy. Um, so you could do a lot of these things with grammar study as well. Okay, very bottom up activity. Um, and the last thing we can do is we can transition this to writing. Okay, so we could use writing frames. What a writing frame is, is we could say, um, you know, we could say something like this bedroom um, has a, a, and a. My bedroom has a, a, and a, right? And I use a lot of these things with my younger learners to, to encourage them to start writing. And they're kind of just having to fill in blanks or fill in ideas. But then once they've started, usually I will say something like, now, can you write me another sentence about your bedroom? And by giving them that structure in the beginning, now they can start writing something else and it encourages them to write a lot more, okay? So with writing, you can do a lot of things. You can summarize, you can, um, what did we read about? You can personalize, we can talk about my bedroom or what I want in my bedroom. Um, we can publish these things, we can make a nice copy and we can stand at the front of class and share it with everyone or do a walk around and read everybody's stories. There's a lot of these things you can do to encourage writing that refers back to the reading, uh, which is good for their memory and it's also building on their writing skills as well. Okay, great. Yeah, it can also be speaking frames as well, exactly, uh, Mandy. Um, you can use these same things as speaking frames um, to help the students speak more, especially if their grammar is a little bit wobbly and they need some grammar help, then having a frame like this can help them a lot too. Very good point. Okay, great. So uh, just to kind of wrap things up here, um, we're about on time, a little over maybe. Uh, reading is very bottom up, top down, nonlinear and multimodal, right? We've got these four aspects to think about, okay? Um, do try and make reading interactive, even online, especially online. You want to be interacting with your students. Um, today, I've just used the chat box and maybe a quick quiz um, in the chat box, but obviously, hopefully, you can also use more um, uh, voice backwards and forwards with your students online. Maybe they're able to share their screens as well. And if you want more ideas about interactive um, online teaching, definitely I suggest take a look at Werner Kuhn's upcoming webinars uh, next week and the week after. He's going to be talking a lot more about this as well. Okay. Um, Make sure to do pre-reading activities to set things up. Uh, during reading activities to make sure the students are focusing on key details that you want them to pay attention to. And then at the end, review and retain that learning and then expand upon it a little bit more by, by doing some post-reading activities. Okay, great. So I hope that was really useful. Now, um, just for a couple of quick minutes, do we have any quick questions that you want to go over quickly? I can make a couple of comments if you have a couple of questions. Just let us know in the chat box, um, or maybe there was a couple in the Q&A. Yeah, you can go to the Q&A or the chat box if you have any questions, Yeah, you can, you can type them in. Yeah, let us, let us know what you think, right? Nice to see lots of people here, so let's see what, what, what you've got to say if you've got any questions. Thank you for your comments, right? <laughs> Okay, seems like no, oh, there's one question in the Q&A. Let me see, what does this one say? Uh, yeah, okay, want to learn more about online teaching, yes. So um, again, like I suggest, I haven't focused too much on the online today, um, but everything I've done is doable online, right? I have done things with you today. You can do them with your students. Today, I haven't had the ability to talk with you, right, to have conversation, but 
Um, when you see Verna sessions or in your own setting, when you're able to let students talk, you can do exactly the same things, okay? Um, online teaching is different, but it's not massively different. You can still do a lot of the same activities, right? Um, okay, someone's asked, uh, can we share some source of reading materials? Um, I'll let Justin send you some information about that, I think. We'll send some out in the, in the, the follow-up. Justin, I'll mention that in a minute. Yep. Um, how long would you spend on the double page spread for grade one students? I'll just answer that one live. Um, that really depends on your teacher's guide and how it's laid out. That double page spread doesn't just have that double page spread. It has pages in the teacher's guide that support that with a lot more activities than I have shown you today, right? Um, I could easily use that double page spread for 60 minutes or 90 minutes with a range of activities. And that's the key. What are the other activities you're doing that are writing or discussion or thinking or drawing or talking? You know, what are these other activities you're doing there as well? Okay, great. Um, I'm Andrew, watching the chat box take, and Q&A yeah. at the same time. Sorry, Justin. Andrew, maybe you take, if you could take, uh, let's take one more and yep. we can, uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up from there. I've, I've got a few more announcements just after it. So why don't you take one yes, more no, question? Yep. Yep. Um, Daniela, uh, I'll just make the comment. You're, you're asking about very young learners. Um, we did a seminar yesterday actually about very young learners and there's a recording on the NGL website. Um, Justin will mention that in, in a minute about where you can find those other webinars. Uh, go and check that one out um, because we talked about young, very young learners and later we will also talk more about pre-literacy skills as well. Um, so for very young learners, go take a look at that one as well. Okay. And someone said, last one, uh, is there look kind of materials for secondary school students? Yes. Uh, go check out our, our um, catalog pages and you'll see a lot of uh, types of learning um, uh, so impacts or um, perspectives or other sorts of programs like that that have a lot of this kind of reading style um, that you can use with your students as well. Reading Explorer even. Okay, great. So Justin, I'm going to pass things back to you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Andrew. No that was a really fantastic webinar. I think, uh, you know, you can see from just the chat box, a lot of people that are really appreciative of, of the ideas that you shared. I know I got a lot out of it. Uh, it's really practical and useful. Thank you so much. Um, and before we uh, let you guys go, just want to announce a couple of uh, things. So you just in case you, you're interested in, in learning more, uh, if you liked what you saw today, uh, we've got a few more upcoming sessions that will probably be of interest to you. Um, a couple of times during the session, Andrew was mentioning uh, another webinar series on uh, getting up and running on teaching online, best practices for teaching online. It was actually a three-part series. We had our first one uh, this week on Wednesday. Uh, the next session, uh, it's presented by Werner Kuhn, uh, who is a, he's the Director of English Studies and Technology at Utopia English, and he's going to be talking about making the most of your time in an online lesson. It should be really useful for everyone that, that might be teaching online now. Uh, and he's got another session as well on engaging your learners online, and that is next week, also Wednesday, April 22nd. Uh, we also, uh, if you if you like uh, teaching young learners, if that's your if, if that's your profession, you'll definitely want to come back uh, next Thursday as well, uh, when National Geographic Learning's own academic marketing manager Kitty Jung is going to be uh, presenting on teaching phonics to young learners, and that's at, also at 10 a.m. on April 16th Singapore time. So we hope you guys can uh, make it back. We're very excited about that one. Uh, next up, besides webinars, we've got a number of uh, resources available to you. Uh, we know that these are unusual times, uh, particularly with COVID-19. A lot of people are now teaching online, some of you for the first time. Uh, National Geographic Learning is here to support you and help you with that uh, and help you as you get up and running with your online classes. Uh, you'll see on the screen, and I'm actually going to type into the chat box a, uh, a URL that you can go and check out National Geographic Learning's global website for online professional development teaching resources. Uh, this is uh, helpful for you in terms of their, their free um, lessons, downloadable lesson plans for teaching your students different age segments on uh, how, how to introduce COVID-19. There's also um, some helpful webinars from authors and experts in the field of teaching online. Uh, so you, uh, I think Andrew mentioned a couple of them. From, uh, from a number of uh, different uh, experts in the field. 
There's also downloadable resources. There are downloadable eBooks to, on uh, professional development for teaching online as well. Uh, please do check out that link uh, in the chat box. Through that webpage, you'll also find um, a way to contact your National Geographic Learning Rep. Uh, if some of you have inquired about how can I uh, get some of these resources that are being shown on, on screen with Andrew, um, there is a link to contact your National Geographic Learning Rep in your uh, particular country or region, uh, and that will be informative for, for accessing eBooks and classroom presentation tools, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, there are other webinars from our global team. Uh, I'm gonna type into the chat box another link for you all right here. Uh, please do, if you haven't already, sign up to receive those. Uh, they've got a number of exciting webinars as well. Uh, teacher trainers, editors, authors, uh, sometimes TED speakers that give um, a number of different kinds of sessions and approaches and ways of thinking about education. Uh, on one more uh, potential resource for you all, we've got a lot for you this morning. There's also an in focus blog. Uh, so blog posts are written by uh, people from National Geographic Learning and also experts in the field of English language teaching uh, from virtually all segments. So if you're looking for some quick ideas and adding variety to your class, uh, you, you'll find some ideas there. You'll notice that a couple of the sessions are very timely about tips for teaching online, uh, building an online community, et cetera. Uh, lastly, the, um, I wanna make sure that everyone knows about our um, ways of keeping in touch with National Geographic Learning. Um, please, if you haven't already, become a fan of us on, on Facebook. Um, you can uh, get a, a link there to upcoming webinars, announcements from National Geographic Learning, et cetera. Uh, for those of you joining us in, in China or those that use WeChat, we also have a WeChat account. Uh, the QR code that you see on the screen, if you're using mobile, you can scan that right now, and that will take you directly to our social page, which, which gives you a number of options, including uh, our Facebook page, um, WeChat, uh, signing up for email from us, and, and you can also check out our website. So we hope that you do that. I hope that we can see you there and keep in touch. And please don't forget about our webinars next week. I'd love to see all of you back here uh, to join us for what we feel will be more exciting webinars from National Geographic Learning. Until then, that's all from us. Uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you again, Andrew. That was great. And uh, see you guys next time. Thank you so much and have a good morning. Bye-bye.